church family. Woo, it is so good to be with you. Um, as we begin, uh, we gathered the, together this morning. I want to just share a portion of scripture with you. It's out of Philippians 4.4. 4. And it's Paul. He is writing to the church of Philippi. He's just giving them some encouraging words. And he says, rejoice. Let me hear you rejoicing. <laughs> okay, good. In the Lord always. When? Always. Always. I will say it again. Rejoice. <laughs> And, and that, in a couple versions, I'm going to read them to you really quick because it, it says a little bit different. It says, always be joyful because you belong to the Lord. I will say it again, be joyful. And then it says, another version says, celebrate God all day, every day. I mean, revel in him. And revel means they, there is no question, there's an expression that your body is excited, you're, you're, it's not just your voice, but it's everything about you. There is, you're just excited and you're joyful. This verse says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. In a time that it is dark and it is gloomy and there is no hope and a lot of faces, well, we can't really see faces, can we? <laughs> <laughs> We're, they're just kind of no face. Um, God says, rejoice. And it's not just in your words, but it's in everything you do. It's in your actions. Why? If you cannot find anything, he says, because you belong to the Lord. And when you belong to the Lord, that gives you reason to be joyful, a reason to express that the world around you can see, hey, in, in the midst of all this, that person is happy. That person has joy. What is it? Let your joy, let as you revel and belong into God, let people see that. Let your body express that. It, but that is your testimony. And as we go throughout our day, keep that on your mind. Keep that on your heart. Be joyful because you know that you belong to the Lord. So today as we enter into a time of worship, let that be what fuels you. I belong to the Lord. And because I belong to the Lord, I have joy. And I'm going to express that joy today through my song. So with me today, why don't you take your hands and just stretch them as an expression of honor and worship and thanksgiving to our God. And thank him that you belong to him. Thank him that he is yours and you are his. Jesus, we thank you. Let your voices just shout it out. Just say it. Just say it. Let your voices let him hear your voices. Jesus, we honor you and we thank you, God, that you are ours and we are yours, God, that we belong to you in a time that is dark, in a time when we have lost hope. Our world has lost hope. God, we belong to you. And for that, we are thankful. For that, there is joy within our hearts. God, and we sing today. We rejoice in knowing that we belong to you. Lord, accept our praises today. God, we honor you in the name of Jesus. Amen.
places to me. Now there's no stopping what you have started until it is complete. When my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're enough for me. And I've decided I'm not good enough. Cause you won't give up on me. You won't give up on me. Your love is so long and it won't let go. I feel it breaking out like an echo. And oh, your love is so long and it won't let go. I feel it breaking out like an echo, echo in my soul. one truth that God is madly in love with you so take courage hold on be strong remember where our help comes from whoa, 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 whoa. Jesus, our redemption, our salvation is in his blood. Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, his kingdom come. So don't let your heart be troubled And hold your head up high Don't fear no evil Fix your eyes on this one truth That God is madly in love with you So take courage, hold on, be strong Remember where our help comes from Oh Sing that this morning. Whoa, 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 whoa,
Swing away, no you haven't. Let the praise go up as the walls come down. Oh creation, everything with breath repeat the sound. And all the children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Come on, sing that again. So swing away, oh you heavens. Let the praise go up as the walls come down. No creation and everything with breath repeat the sound. And all the children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Come on, sing that one more time. Swing a wire, I know you have it. Let the praise go up as the walls come down. Your creation and everything with breath repeat the sound. No only children, clean and pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Come on, let's praise in this place. Whoa. Creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All the children, clean as pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Jesus, our redemption, our salvation. Sing his love. Come on, sing his name. Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, his kingdom come. We're going to take a few minutes and we're going to pray this morning. And we're going we're gonna to start by think, uh, thanking God for his goodness in our lives. Amen. That, that song just said, fix our eyes on this one truth that God is madly in love with you. And how that presented in our lives is God sent his son to die on a cross to purchase our salvation. But not only that, our healing, our joy, our peace. Amen. Amen. So we're going to pray this morning. We're going to pray to that good, good God, good father, uh, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I'm going to ask you to lift your voices with me, and we're going to pray. We're going to press in. We're going to take a, a little bit of time. We're going to pray for the nations. We're going to pray for our, our church, our church family. But before we do, I want to uh, prime the pump with this verse. It says uh, in 1 John chapter 5, uh, there are 13 and 14, but I'm going to go back to verse 11. It says, and this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. Amen. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. And then in verse 13, it says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Amen. Yeah. Not eternal life in the, the future, in the distant, eternal life right now. Amen. And it goes on to say, and this is the confidence that we have. Man, how good is it to have confidence in this one thing, that, that we have eternal life? Um, but it says, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. So as we pray, we're going to pray for the will of God. And what's the will of God? You may say, what's the will of God? How many times have you asked that? God, what is your will for my life? Does God will for you to have peace in your life? Yes. Do, anybody? Yes. Does God will for you to, to, to have joy? Yes. Does God will that all should be saved? 
Yes, we know this because he said it in his word. And so when we pray, we're going to pray his will over our lives, over our nation, over our church, and over this region. Amen. So let's, let's start by lifting his name. Father, we thank you. God, you are good. God, you are faithful. God, you are mighty. You are on the throne. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. God, oftentimes we'll look to a leader to, to tell us which way to go. But God, you are over all leaders. And so God, we look to you. God, we get it, begin to speak truth over our own lives. The enemy would lie to us and fill our head with, with deception that, that we can't make it, that we're not going to get to the finish line, that this problem's not going to be resolved. But God, we declare your goodness in every situation in our lives. God, the things that you said we could have, God, we proclaim. God, you said you sent your son to die on a cross to purchase our salvation, but our healing so that we can be free from from our sins so that we can experience the fullness of life. And so God, we just pray that over each one of our, our lives, over everybody that's here, everybody that's watching, God, we just declare your goodness. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this nation that you have blessed us with. We recognize it is our responsibility to lead with your authority. So God, we look out and we declare that you are doing a new thing across our nation. We will perceive it. Jesus, we are not shaken, but we are stirred as the ground that is being prepared to, to have new things planted and sprout forth. We are being churned up, stirred. The old things that we have settled with, that ground is being broken up. Our, our, our comfort levels have been disrupted and disturbed, but that is in a preparation for what you are going to do through us. So we look forward to what you are going to do through us, individuals, the people that are here, the people that are watching, the people that are part of our church family here locally, beyond this region, to globally, God, the, the C3 church family that we are a part of. God, you have declared that you want to move through your people. So we are responding here and now. Yeah. Not with fear of, of all the, the tumult that is around us, all the things that, that are coming against us, but with excitement that what the enemy comes against us with, God, you're going to flip that. Yeah. You're going to use that for your glory and your honor, but you're going to do that through us. So we declare today that we will respond with faith. We will respond with mercy. We will respond with love to the things that are coming against us, that are coming against the people that are, are, are declared yours and they don't know it yet, that we will reach out to them with love and mercy and kindness and declare your goodness to them amidst all of this so that not just our nation will be healed, but that your kingdom will be expanded in this nation and beyond. God, we thank you for these things. In your son's name we pray. Let's continue to pray for our church family, our church family members that are here, our church family members that are at home and around the globe, and just uh, ask that, that God's hand would be upon them. Amen. Father, again, we thank you for your goodness. God, we thank you, God, that you have collected uh, people into your family. They have become a part of your family because of what you have done. God, you have allowed us to be adopted into your family. Those that 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 would have cried out to to crucify your son. God, you allowed us to be redeemed by that crucifixion, by that blood, and, and allowed us to be adopted into the family. And so we pray for your global church family all around the globe for C3. God, we thank you for Pastor Phil and Chris Pringle. God, we thank you for our local leaders here, for the, for Pastor Stephen Rowena, for the Davies up in Seattle, uh, uh, for the Brooks family, for the Crawford family down in the Portland area. God, we thank you for them. God, we Thank you for Pastor Kerry and Rianne as they're beginning that work in Texas. God, we just pray blessings, God. Let us be beacons of hope and light to, to the world. Where there's, where there's darkness, God, we want to stand out and we want to shine your light. God, we thank you. God, you are good. You are faithful. You are mighty. God, we thank you for your love for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said real loud, amen, amen. Well, let's continue to worship this morning. God is madly in love with you. So 
opportunity to give and as we prepare to give I just want to share a story out of the Bible uh, with you with a little a twist um, we are all familiar with the the story of the feeding of the 5,000 where we had the boy with the five loaves of bread and the two fish and we know how that story ends but I want you to take and use your imagination we have lots of children here, so we're going to think on their level. <laughs> and I teach kids, so I like to, I like to, you know, try to be as visual as I can when we're telling a story. And I want you to take the place, put your feet in the place of the boy um, as we go through this story today. It's uh, the port, the scripture I want to read is John six five through six it's out of the message and it says when jesus looked out and saw that a large crowd had arrived he said to philip where can we buy bread to feed these people he said this to stretch philip's faith and that's a word we've heard quite a bit this year <laughs> stretch <laughs> but jesus already knew what he was going to do so the question was for Philip. And we know how that story ends, but I want to think, look at it from the boy's perspective. I don't know if this is true or how it actually happened, but I, I don't know how old the boy was. I, it just says boy. But I want to think that the boy was old enough to be on his own. He had a lunch. He was thinking ahead. That's a good sign, right? Mom must have been there with him. <laughs> Son, you're going to stay out all day. This is what you're going to need. And so he had his five loaves and two fish. And he went out, I, I believe, just because what I read, that he went out to go follow Jesus for the day. He wanted to be near him so he could see, hear him and see the things that he was going to do. And so he packed his lunch. And the verse says, uh, it says, Philip, you figure it out. We see this crowd of people. What are we going to do? Philip's like, I don't know. There's so many people. We, we, don't, we can't even get enough food for all these people. And then Andrew said, Jesus, here's this boy. And he has five loaves and two fish. And the boy, it doesn't say that they were trying to pry his lunch out of his hand. It didn't, doesn't tell me that they were trying to convince the boy, hey, Jesus needs your lunch. Why don't you just give it to, to him? He said, whoa, I want to think that he got excited. He said, oh, I get to see Jesus face to face. I get to be right. I'm taking him my lunch. They, he wants it. I'm going to go give it to him. And he, the, he brought him his lunch willingly. And he gave it to Jesus because Jesus already knew what he was going to do. 
and he blessed it. And the Bible tells us that out of that, that lunch, there was enough to feed everyone there plus till they were full. And then when they collected back, there was leftovers. Good thing for leftovers, right? Woo, yeah. And there were 12 baskets full. And I don't, you know, I don't know what, what happened to those 12 baskets. But I want to think that because out of G the generosity of Jesus, that that boy gave willingly. And he said, you know what? Give them to the boy. Let him take them home. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> I don't, you know, and knowing Jesus, he wasn't like these little baskets with the, you know, little little bread basket. Oh, no. Jesus said, I'm, I'm imagining in my, in that there were big baskets. I don't know. We'll ask. And they were full. And the boy took them home. Maybe somebody helped him carry them home. Because that's 12 baskets. Even a, you know, he only had two hands, right? So he had to have, maybe his family was there. Now I'm thinking about it. I don't know. But he took them home and he blessed it. And, you know, I want to think that God is just looking. It doesn't matter how much you, you have or you don't have. What talents you have or you don't think you have. You might say, Jesus, I know he needs something for me, but what do I have to offer? He's just looking to say, hey, whatever I have, whatever you have, you give it to Jesus. And he already knows what he is going to do with that. And he will bless it and he will multiply it. And you will have more, more blessing than you know what to do with. And I don't know what that will look like for you, but Jesus already knows what he is going to do. So like that boy, whatever you have today, what, uh, what gift that you have to bring to Jesus, that you give it willingly with your whole heart and say, Jesus needs it, I give it to him. And stand back and see the blessing of the Lord in your life. So why don't you stand with me? And whatever you have today, you just, just give it to the Lord willingly and watch him bless your life. Amen? Amen. <laughs> okay, let us, let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you bless that willing heart, God, that you bless the life that says, hey, whatever I have, Jesus, I give to you, whether it be much, whether it be little. God, you require it of me, I give it to you, God, and then you will you will bless beyond measure in immeasurable ways and ways that we never even thought, God, because you think bigger than we do. And we we thank you for that. We thank you for the blessings in advance. Lord, meet the needs that are here today. Meet the needs of our church, of our community, of our church family. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We just willingly give to you what we have, and we receive your blessing over our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. And it's great to have you here. I want you to remain standing. We're going to jump into our message. We're in a new series entitled Reboot. And we'll get into what that means. It's so great to see all. I see live faces. Over the last six months, I've recorded out in the woods, down trails, standing in a cr in a creek, in, bed, in my bedroom, in my living room. And there's nothing like seeing living people that I know and that I love and that I care about. It's great to look you in the eyes. And for those of you who are at, uh, at home, we honor you. We bless you. we got this live stream so that you can take advantage of it. Well, let's not shrink back. Let's press in. God wants to speak some things to us about this idea of reboot. We have a verse that they're going to bring up for me right here. And the verse, uh, gosh, I'm going to turn around. I don't have my notes in front of me yet. It says, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah could be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. He stirred up a king, right? And it goes on to say, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and... He has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. So today I've entitled my message. Uh, if they'll give it, you guys give it to me. So that, <laughs> I don't even remember what my title is at this point. The practice of rebooting. And I believe that this is a spiritual principle uh, that we see in technology, but we'll talk more about it. God is desiring to help you to reboot 
as you experience glitches in your life. Father, we pray over each person who's here, each person who's listening at home. Lord, we step into your word right now. Your word is living and active. Father, we know that your word can speak truth and help us, but it like it breaks through rock and it uncovers the heart of, of, of flesh and allows us to hear hope again. And it allows us to hear faith again. It allows us to be stirred to action. And so I pray for each person listening. Father, they'll understand the principle of the reboot, which we see in the life of Israel through Cyrus, but we see it all over scripture. And Father, we experience it all over the place in our journey with you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everyone said, nice and loud here and at home. Amen. And amen. Give the Lord a hand as you're seated, okay? And we're going to jump in and take a look at scripture. And today's such a great day. By the way, in the process of getting ready, hopefully all of you here live, and if you're at home, we're going to be celebrating communion together. And so if you want to grab some bread and grab some juice so that we can do that at home, everyone here present also, uh, hopefully you've got uh, communion there near you, and we will be able to enjoy it together as a church family. How's everybody doing? Good. It is exciting to be able to see living people. Uh, I did want to take a moment and just express my incredible appreciation. I mean, when I say incredible, not that my appreciation is expressed incredibly, but thank you to our entire team. Uh, thank you to Steve and the worship team for uh, the, 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 what's required to do all of what we're doing right now is very difficult. There's a thousand different things that are going on. And believe it or not, you think it's really, really simple, but they're mixing sound. Glenn back there and the team earlier this morning, mixing two sets of sound because Facebook land is live for what you need to hear and for what we need to hear here in the room. Our screens team, our, our production team, great job, you guys. Thank you for all of, give our, give our team a huge, come on, give the team a huge hand. Okay. And again, we will uh, be sharing in communion. Now, in, up here in front of me, and probably most of you, if you're over like the age of eight, you probably have a smartphone in your possession or some sort of smart device. And that has been, become pretty common in our everyday lives, functioning with these very expensive devices that we stare mindlessly at. But if you were to look uh, at statistics, 1.52 billion of these are sold every single year. It's an insane amount. Now, if you back down to the year 2007, there were actually just a few hundred thousand sold then because the year before there were no smartphones. In fact, I'm going to date myself a little bit, but I started off my technological journey in 1997. I bought what was called a PDA and I carried it with me everywhere. This is actually an original Palm Pilot, a device that didn't really have a light up screen. It was LED. And for those of you young people, I want to tell you, breaking technology. I carried it in a little wallet with my checkbook and my credit cards. And in this device, I could write down appointments that I had that were upcoming in a little calendar. And I could write down to-do list things. Like if I thought I got to pick up bread on the way home, I could put it in there. And if you were to give me your phone number, I could take your phone number and put it in my device. Now, it couldn't call anyone. I had to take my flip phone out, look at my device, type in the number, and then call you on the phone. It really wasn't any type of real smart device, but it was the beginning way. But then in 2007, Palm introduced this technology to their new smartphone. And so there on the left, you can see the first Palm phone. And this was amazing because it had a light up screen. And not only could you do all the things that I've mentioned, but instead of pulling out my flip phone, now the device was two in one. It allowed me to even get on the internet. Very, very glitchy though. And of course you can see the picture of the first iPhone. And after a while of being a resistor, I then uh, heard from heaven and I bought an iPhone and made life much easier. Unlike those of you who have an Android device who you're buffering probably right now and can't hear what I'm saying. Uh, but with that, uh, my children began to experience and my wife began to experience the world of smart technology, which wasn't that synchronized back then. And so regularly in our home, you could hear this mounting frustration that would begin to develop. And it was somebody using their smart device and it wasn't working seamlessly. And it would ramp up in emotions and uh, anger and rage and things being thrown around the room. And then Rowan would say, Steve, calm down. And we developed a, a, a question that was very simple. Have you turned it off and then turned it back on again? And it was after all that frustration, everybody was like, oh, that's right. And so you would power off the device 
and power it back on. And that's known today as rebooting, and many of you probably do that all the time. Uh, but what it did, it, you would have a normal synchronized function going on your phone, and then a glitch would be introduced. Something about the process of what you were doing and the software involved and the fact that way back then in 2007, this was all new and things would get bound up. And believe it or not, back then, we actually, we actually blamed ourselves. We figured, I don't know if I'm using this correctly. And so you'd try and you keep doing this and you'd work around the problem. And then you had to be reminded at that moment that maybe you actually are not doing anything wrong. You just need to reboot. So you'd come to that moment of recognition. And then you'd reboot, you'd turn it off, you'd turn it back on, and you'd find yourself stepping back into the free flow, that normal synchronized function of the, the, uh, the, the uh, smart device. I want to say this, reboots play a critical role in technology, but reboots play a critical role in our spiritual growth. They play a critical role as individuals. They play a critical role as families, as churches, even as nations. This concept of rebooting is critical, okay? Because here's the deal with the world that you live in. The world that you live in right now is going to do everything to glitch your world. It's just very natural. There's a, a, a law called the law of entropy, which means things gradually move to a level of decline. In other words, you build a sandcastle out on the beach, and you come back 10 years later, do you expect to see the sandcastle still there? No, because a child is going to see it or a grown man's going to see it and destroy it two seconds after you abandon it, right? Because that's we, we just do that type of thing. But even if you didn't touch it, the waves coming in, the wind blowing, the sun baking, entropy kicks in, and things that had order tend to gravitate downwards to chaos. What does that mean like in other areas? So batteries will wear out just sitting in the drawer. Uh, gasoline will dissipate over time. Light will become dim. The bulbs will go, grow dull because we live in a world where not only is there a spiritual curse, but it impacts everything else. And things are typically in decline, especially spiritually. I don't know about you, but I've had some amazing encounters with God. And man, what, how, many, how many of you have been like on the top of the mountain? You've been like, whoa, I feel God. He's blessing my life. This is amazing. Three of you? Okay, good. No, you had, oh, I didn't need to count you at home. Yeah, we've had those moments. Now, how many of you know that a couple weeks later, that begins to leak out or dissipate? It does. It's, and I, what I want you to hear from me right now, it's so important to not walk in shame and feel like, what is wrong with me? God blessed my life, and I'm not maintaining that blessing. What's at work in your life at that point in time is just this law of entropy. You were fired up. You were going well. But that, that emotion tends to go to decline. The passion tends to go to decline. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. It means you live in this natural world that's going to work against you being at the top of your game, right? And so that law, spiritual law means that we need to be filled back up because we will begin to start glitching. And so we jump into the story in Ezra in a reboot moment, as you look at the scripture there, we've already read it, but I want to give you a little background what's going on. As the Lord stirs up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, this is actually an incredible moment of reboot. Now, you'd you could see this happen a lot of times in the Bible, but there's a storyline here that gets a little bit complicated, so I won't go into all the details, but if you were to read the book of 2 Kings towards the end, 2 Chronicles towards the end, Ezra... Nehemiah and Esther get into Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and especially I'll point out in Daniel today, it all captures what leads up to this moment. If you were to study the history of Israel and especially towards the end where this is happening, we read in 740 BC in the book of 2 Kings where a king named tiglath Pileser from Assyria comes in and marches into Israel, which has now become a divided nation. Uh, back up a little bit. You remember that David established, really helped under, after Saul to establish the kingdom, handed the kingdom off to his son Solomon, built an amazing temple, the power of God, the presence of God. They were at a high. They opened up the temple one day. The power of God was so strong. Like right now, people could hardly come into the room, right? And so the priests were outside. Nobody could do anything. They were on their spiritual high. Their software was synchronized. Everything was dialed in. But over time, as Solomon was the king, he began to experience some glitching. 
And especially as he got older, he allowed some things to come in, some foreign code, some foreign software that caused the smart uh, context of his spirit to begin to move sideways, especially in his older years. He began to depart from the living God, and he began to add in some foreign gods. What ends up happening as he dies, his son takes reign, and the kingdom is split in half. Ten tribes go with his son, and then, or I'm sorry, ten tribes leave his son, one tribe stays with his son, and we have the division of Israel into the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah. And so jumping up towards Cyrus, here's a couple things that happened. 740 BC, Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, comes in and captures all the people of Israel and deports them back to Assyria. I mean, you want to talk about glitching. Now we're talking about this blue screen of death, control, alternate, delete, if some of you even know what that means from the 90s, right? And in 2 Kings, he actually brings some of the people back later on and puts them in, in Syria and from Babylon because he wants to establish his culture in God's city, really glitching out. A couple hundred years later, Judah is doing a little bit better, but in 559 BC, in the book of 2 Kings chapter 25, King Nebuchadnezzar, this is where you'll, you'll remember this, marches in, he besieges Jerusalem, he invades Jerusalem, he burns down, tears down the temple of God, tears down all the king's houses, burns all of the city, tears down the walls, deports almost everyone except for the very poorest of people, and carries them back to Babylon. He is a pagan, ungodly, ruthless leader who is conquering the world. How do we get to this spot? Glitching, small glitches. Now everything's all bound up spiritually and as a nation. You'll remember that a couple of the young men who were taken away, their names were Daniel. I mean, you, you kids here, you know, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were actually taken from their homes and dragged to Babylon. But in the process, and this is an amazing thing, in bad situations, God can do great things. Thank you, David. Anybody else? Are you, are you, do I need to come out? Seriously. I mean, God can do great things in terrible situations. In the worst, and he does this in the worst political climate on the planet. Nebuchadnezzar, an ungodly man, deports these young men. He wants to train them in the ways of Babylon. And in the process, we're introduced to Daniel chapter 2 where he has a dream, the king has a dream, he wants it interpreted, he's not going to tell what the dream is because he wants a in revelation and an interpretation and none of the pagan uh, soothsayers and, and futurists can come up with that. But Daniel prays, he gets his three friends to pray and God gives him a revelation of what the dream is. How many of you know that God can reveal his truth to us? Amen. Come on, help me, help me out here. Look alive because you're going to need some information from God. God reveals the truth. Who does he reveal it to? Daniel. And Daniel, I want to say this. For those of you who believe that church and politics should stay separate, uh, God doesn't apparently think so because Daniel has been installed in a political position. Okay? There's no such thing as separation of church and state. We as believers should be involved with the political arena to influence it with the kingdom of God. I think we run into some risks uh, that you see Daniel avoids. Daniel is in a pagan country, and he's not calling out Nebuchadnezzar saying, you shouldn't be in charge. You, you're horrible. What he does is he steps into the moment to bring kingdom principles into a dark moment Right? Because if you spend your life telling people how wrong they are, you're never gonna, they're never gonna join the right. Right. Okay? Right. But when you step into a wrong situation and you say, I hear what you're saying, but tell you what, God will reveal that dream and I'll give you the interpretation. And what happens? Daniel does that. And what how does Nebuchadnezzar respond? Oh no, no, you're God things now. I'm not interested in that junk. Let me tell you what, there are moments when the darkest heart experiences the light of God, when God's people are on mission. And he hears the revelation of the dream. He perks up. This guy has peered into my soul. He's seen my dream. What's the interpretation going to be? And there's an interpretation that's amazing. You know what he does? He responds. He says, there's no God like your God. And he promotes in politics Daniel, who then says, hey, I got three friends. They're good dudes. They helped me to come up with this revelation. So Nebuchadnezzar has an experience with God, and promotes these young men politically. Daniel chapter 3, now, Nebuchadnezzar has had an experience with God, but listen, there's probably, in your case, you had an experience, but it didn't necessarily grab your heart yet. 
Anybody? That was you. Me, I had to have a couple encounters. So Daniel chapter number three, Nebuchadnezzar, somebody whispers in his ear, hey, you should set up an idol and we'll all worship it when the music kicks on. Oh, that sounds like a good idea to me. And so he does this and there are three young men, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, the guys he promoted who will not bow down. And so word is stirred up and Nebuchadnezzar, though he's had an experience with God, he has not been completely cleansed and redeemed, right? Like probably like all of us. There's some things we're doing really well in, but there's still some things like people driving in the left lane down I-5, not passing anyone. It causes a little bit of consternation and flesh to arise, right? So we, we find ourselves muttering things that our mother would whoop us if she heard us say. And so Nebuchadnezzar says, fire up that fiery furnace, and we are going to throw these Hebrews in there. And he does. And then divine math kicks in. I tell you, divine math is an amazing thing. Three men go in, and Nebuchadnezzar begins to count, and he says, there's a fourth person in there, and he looks like the son of God. And in the process, he calls the three out. They come out of the furnace. They're, they don't smell like smoke. You smell like smoke. We drove here in a, an apocalyptic fume. And I tell you what, in, in Ridgefield this morning, I had to take an ax to chop away the smoke for my car to move. It was like hitting a brick wall, but I chopped my way to get here to be with you. And uh, so uh, I don't know where I was going with that. But so uh, they bring out these three Hebrews. They didn't even smell like smoke, even though they had been in the furnace. And they conveyed to him the reality of the presence of God. And Nebuchadnezzar was so blown away. He said, there is no God like your God. And what does he do again? He promotes them again. And he has the men thrown into the fiery furnace who said, you know, it was just crazy what was going on there. So Nebuchadnezzar has an encounter with God, has an encounter. The soft, there's this divine reboot that happens in his life. God captures his heart. But you know what? Entropy kicks in and he begins to deviate a little bit. And not long after that, in Daniel chapter number four, he's standing on his castle wall. He's looking out over all of Babylon. And his pride kicks in. Not that that's ever happened to you. You did something great. You begin to stand back and say, behold, yeah. I have done all this. Martin, you catch a giant fish. Behold, I am fisherman of fishermen. The anointing of God is on me. In fact, I've given myself my own anointing to capture fish. And there's that moment of great pride, right? And this was so extreme that a voice from out, came out of heaven and spoke to, Dan, spoke to uh, Nebuchadnezzar and said, tonight your kingdom will depart from your hand. And so you read later on, Daniel chapter 5, his son takes over. His name is Belshazzar, and he has that same pride issue. And there comes a moment where the kingdom is ripped out of his hand. 539 BC, Daniel chapter 5, Belshazzar was slain. And the Bible says you'll recognize this name, Darius shows up on the scene. Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. I don't know what age you are at, but listen, you could be old or you could be young and still be in the process of God. We start looking at our calendar. Me, I'm like, listen, I'm only 29 now, and listen, I'm running out of time, right? Okay? But I want you to know that the God's, as long as there's breath, God's not done with you. And so Darius gets put in that position, and he begins to take over, and he has an encounter with Daniel as well. And in the process, he's tricked. Daniel goes and prays. There's a law against praying. Then he finds out he has to throw Daniel in the lion's den. And he is brokenhearted because he's begun to experience the presence of God in his life. A design, divine reset that we've yet to see, don't really see in scripture, has already taken place because he's falling in love with Daniel's God. And I want to tell you, that's how we need to function in this world. There is incredible darkness out there. There's incredible evil. There's incredibly wrong doctrines, wrong teachings, wrong way of thinking, wrong way of politics. But again, if we get functioning from the position where we are the proclaimers of death, we're like corners walking around. That's wrong, and you're wrong, and that person's wrong. You need to go down. You're going to burn in hell. Listen, we're not going to be effective at winning anybody over. He, he, Daniel somehow has this capability all these pagan kings that should want to kill him end up having encounters, and Darius is no different. When he throws Daniel in the lion's den, he prays all night. That's what's going on in his life. Pray, praise the living God. And when he opens up the cave the next day and Daniel's still alive, he celebrates and he orders that those men who, who made this whole thing up be thrown into the lion's den. And the Bible says before their bodies touched the bottom of the den, they were broken to pieces by the lions. It is remarkable what God does. So Darius has this divine reset that happens in his life. 
Now, outside of the Bible, in a different place, there was a man named Cyrus who was merging the Persian and Median empires at that time. And a few late years later, after Darius has this encounter with Daniel, Cyrus invades and he takes all of the Babylonian empire, which steps us into Ezra chapter one. And it happens again. Don't tell me that God can't reach people in political positions. There are people right now who hate on either side of the political aisle because how could you ever even pray for president so-and-so or governor so-and-so? Let me tell you the way we win is not by hating people and refusing to pray. It's by loving. And even as the Bible said, Jesus said this, pray for your enemies. What, pray that they are lynched? No. Pray that they're, they have miserable lives? No. Pray that God invades their world. Because yes. this Cyrus, who is like, I can't even imagine, you know, at what level this guy is functioning at, Cyrus ends up having an encounter with God and a divine reset because we read here in the scripture that God touches his heart. And after all these people of God have been stolen... And the city of God burned down and the walls torn down. Cyrus makes an edict that they fund and send all of the people back to build the house of God so the world can experience the presence of God, the house of God so people can gather so that the divine reboot will take place and God's agenda is flowing back as it's intended to be. Are you tracking with all that? So this is a moment of divine reboot. Your passion's going to fade. Your spiritual fire's going to go out. Your vision for your future, it is going to darken. Your anointing will leak. Sin will settle in the form of wrong thinking, wrong attitudes, and wrong actions. You will deviate just a hair, and you will deviate a hair, and you'll find yourself over here in COVID 2020, putting on 35 pounds, thinking the world is going to end, hating everybody possibly. It's all part of the glitching process. But I want to tell you, there is this divine reboot that can happen here and it can happen now in your life. It's the turning off and repowering so that you can come back to the starting point to put first things first and move forward synchronized with the plans that God has for your life. Does that make sense? Anybody yes. tracking? Yeah. Amen. Come on. Yes. Come on. In the back, help me out. At home, yell at the screen. I can hear it. Listen, I can, I can sense it. Yell at, yell at the screen. Okay. So I found that for my life, this reboot comes in several different ways. I want to help to walk you through this. And as, uh, as I go through these, make sure that you have your communion ready to go uh, so that we can celebrate it together. All right. Okay. Let me give you three ways that we reboot. All right. This, these will be very practical for you that you can employ as an individual, as a family, and also as a um, you know, as a church, we're going to get to participate in communion, which is one of the forms of rebooting that we get to participate all the time. You could do, you could have communion every day at home with your family if you wanted to. But what does that look like? Okay. Um, I don't know about you, but with my smartphone, I just regularly turn it off and turn it back on again. I notice that there's just sometimes, do your phone do some weird things? Yeah. Tells you you have emails and you check and there's no email in there. You start to use an app and you're like, what's going on? And you have to do a workaround. And next thing you know, part of it's working and part of it's not working. And you're like, what's going on? I almost every day now jump into my apps. And I click on, on an iPhone on my face and it brings up all of my apps. And I find, you got 15 apps that need to be updated. I'm like, oh my gosh, we get to reboot. And so I hit refresh. It begins to refresh. And then when it's done, I turn my phone off and I turn it back on. And I find that it syncs just absolutely so incredibly well. You know, you and I, much like our phone, we pick up these glitches. Again, when you walked in from outside, some of you smell like smoke and you don't even realize it. You know why? Because we go out in a world that's got bad attitudes, people complaining, profanity, vulgarity, hate. Somebody comes to us at work and we were fine, but they whisper in our ear, hey, hey you know your boss. You know what he's doing now? Did you see the new car he bought? He's like in a time when we should be hunkering down and we're not making what we should be making. He's, he bought a new used car. How dare he? And we're like, yeah, you're right. How dare he? And next thing you know, we've taken up somebody else's offense and we're getting stirred up. We're walking around and after a couple of days at that, we're yelling at our kids and we're yelling at our wife or our wife is yelling at us and nobody can do anything right. And there's just this, this glitching that begins to happen. We pick up the world's residue. 
and it causes glitches in our life. It gets us out of sync with God. How many of you know that a bad attitude will get you out of sync with the Spirit of God? Mm -hmm. yes. a, a negative, complaining, you know, if there's anything that God, God hates some things. He mentions them. You know what God really hates? Believe it or not, it doesn't seem that offensive, but complaining. Complaining is a pointing the finger at God saying you're not doing your job right. That's really what it is. If I were God, things would be better. Really? really? You really think so? I don't know. I'm not sure I want to check out that world. I don't want, even if I'm in control, I've been there. It's bad. But complaining gets us out of sync with God. And I can have somebody tell me, you know, you have a better attitude. What's your first reaction when somebody tells you you need to have a better attitude? I'll punch you in the face, fool. That's just how we kind of navigate through it. And so we need to have moments where we regularly look at our lives to check for the smell of smoke, to check for residue. Psalm chapter 139, verses 23 and 24. I love this about David. David regularly practiced rebooting as a regular spiritual discipline. In other words, he looked at his life and he said, okay, am I out of sync anywhere here? Are my apps needing to be updated? He says, Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me into the way of everlasting. In other words, man, I'm, it's time for a shower. It's that type of thing. That was the regular practice of David. If you read Psalm 51, he's talking much about the same thing. He says, Lord, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that have been broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart. You know why David needed his heart to be cleaned? Because our hearts get dirty. Anybody here? Yes. Are you still with me? Yes. Our hearts get dirty. We pick up the residue. It pollutes us. It causes glitches between us, our friends, our family, our finances, our relationships, our outlook for the future. And he goes on to say, don't just, don't just clean my heart, but renew a right spirit within me. And he says this, cast me not away from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. You know, the attitudes of your heart will actually... God doesn't walk away from us. We push God away with that dirtiness that's in our life. You're like, man, I wish the worship team would get their act together so we could feel God's presence. And you need to get your heart cleansed because you could have a ukulele and a one-armed man playing with his toes. I don't know if there's such a thing. And you can worship God when your heart's right and your heart is pure. It doesn't take a special song or a certain, certain uh, uh, caliber of, of, of professionalism in worship. It takes a right heart. And so David prayed, clean me up, Lord. Don't take your presence away. In other words, let me get back into your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. We also have this moment of communion. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28 says, let a person examine himself and then so eat the bread and drink of the cup. This is a regular practice of me saying, Lord, as I get ready to receive communion, I want to look at my life. These symbols represent you washing me and cleansing me and healing me. Basically, the original update of my software system happened by what you did these symbols represent. And Lord, as I take communion again, I want to quickly scan my life and I want to internally say, ah, I recognize I've been really frustrated lately. God, I've been frustrated because I'm, I'm not appreciating your goodness. I'm looking at the small dirt, not seeing all the great things that you've done. Father, I've been very frustrated with people. God, as I take communion, this is a moment of reboot. Does that make sense? Yes. I would challenge you, look in your own life and do this regularly. I know I have to. I could probably do it every day when I get up and have to do it by the time I go to bed that night. But it's helpful because there is a divine reset. And when, it hap when I do that, I find that, believe it or not, my negative downward thinking immediately shifts and I'm able to look upward and get excited and once again refresh that vision, renew that anointing, renew the sense of God's presence. After I do that, I'm like, oh man, I feel like God really loves me. He's loved me the whole time. I've just been distanced because of the glitching that I've not dealt with. Second thing, second way you can reboot is just by recognizing when there's glitching happening. You know, early on when the glitches would happen on a phone, we, we really did think like, I, I must not know what I'm doing because it was complicated. It didn't feel easy to do stuff on the computer. It didn't feel easy on the iPhone and say so like, well, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. And a lot of times, and I've seen this even in today's day where I'll get on 
not to mention any names, but maybe somebody I know, their computer, and I see all this craziness going on, on the screen. I'm like, what do you, what's going on on your computer? They're like, oh, I just ignore that, and I work around all of that. And I'm like, there's like major glitching going on here. Let's fix it. And then I get the, I see some husbands looking at some wives. And then I get, get word that I didn't ask you to look at this so you could fix my world. I just want you to tell me what to do here. And I understand that. But that is so common that we end up with this spiritual glitching, this social glitching, and this relational glitching going on in our world. And instead of dealing with it, we just end up working around it, which is inconvenient. And it's also out of sync with God. Because when you're, the Bible says when your relationship is glitching with your wife, husbands, your prayers are going to be hindered. Not that God can't hear them, but you're not in alignment with him. And the glitching should cause you to recognize that you need to reboot with God. It just comes right down to that. Because again, all of even the best moments of our life will fade. We did a great wedding here. It's kind of unexpected. I mean, we were supposed to do a wedding yesterday in Sandy for uh, Philip and Nicole McKesh. And then they were going to get married out, 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 I joked with them outside on top of the septic tank over there on the church property. And I pointed out that's, that's the area we were standing in. And you don't find that funny? I don't think that they, <laughs> I was like, this is great. Lay down next to the lids and we'll take a picture and for laughs. Um, but um, they ended up coming into the, in, the inside. And as I stepped into the day, somebody, I saw they posted this picture of this African man who was marrying uh, his new bride. And they're standing up at the altar. And after I watched this video, I was dying laughing. I sent it to Philip, and I said, this is how I want to see you respond when she walks down the aisle. And in this video, this man, he turns around, and it's a real video. It's not made up. He walks up. He lifts up his veil, and he goes, oh, hallelujah. Oh, oh. And he starts, woo. And he begins to pray in tongues and celebrate and shout, thank you, Jesus. Woo. And he starts crying and he starts weeping and he makes his way back over and he daringly like lifts up her veil again. Woo! Glory to God! Thank you, Lord! He begins bawling. This goes on for five minutes and he is so sincere in his joy and his passion. I think it was actually a video of Rowena lifting up my veil to look at me on our wedding day. But how many of you know... <laughs> too far. Yeah, too far. <laughs> um, how many of you know that that might be the feeling on the altar, Okay. But over a period of time, that leaks out, and then some words are said or some aggravation, some rub moment, you know, and then you find yourself in a spot where if you look at the circumstances, I'm fighting, you're lean, you're, we're going to bed, and you're not saying goodnight, you're facing that way, I'm facing that way, just maybe speaking to somebody out there, instead of blaming your spouse, the real issue is there's something probably out of alignment with God in your own heart. And you need to recognize when your finances dry up, when you're used to functioning in God's presence, and now I don't feel like God's presence is close. Did God leave? No, God didn't leave. There's something out of sync in my world. And that's a moment when you look, if you will look at your life, where you can actually recognize that you need to hit a reboot, where you need to get down on your knees and say, Lord, cleanse me. Lord, wash me. Allow your spirit to come over me once again. When there's those things aren't working, where there's friction in relationships, where there's internal chaos, where God's presence is missing in your life at this moment, when faith is down and negativity is up, it's time for a reboot. Let me give you the third and final thing. Reboot is also valuable when you're, you're going to love this. Lean forward for this. Put your chin out because you're about to get a little spiritual slap here. Reboot is especially valuable when you're confronted, right? When God says it's time for a reboot. Because here's the beautiful thing about the God that we serve he wants to lead you and teach you in the way that you should go. Now, some of us, we kind of boil words like this in Psalm 32 down into, he's going to teach me to read my Bible. He's going to teach me how to give at church. Now, you need to know for you students, like, what college should I enroll in? What's the right one? God's practical on that level. He wants to teach you in the way that you should go. Do you know that he has a plan for your life? I mean, there's some things that are important. I mean, some, some young, young boy catches your eye but you can only see his bright smile. You can't see his dark heart. God's able to help lead you in the way that you should go, right? You could have two children. I've experienced this, okay, where uh, you're a pro at parenting that kid, but man, what is wrong with that one? <laughs> Anybody? No, don't raise your hand. No, don't raise your hands, okay? And, and here's the truth is that there is a, the reality that different children under the same parenting require different parenting styles or, or approaches. Some kids need a lot of rules. Some kids only need one. Some kids, 
need to be looked at sternly, and it just crushes them. And other kids, uh, spare the rod, spoil the child, so don't spare the rod. Ratchet up, okay? In a proper way, of course, but to discover what that thing that makes that work takes God to bring a revelation. It absolutely does. And so sometimes as God has promised to instruct us in the way that we should go, he, he says this, I will counsel you with my eye upon you. I'm going to show you who you should be spending your time with. I'm going to show you, should you start that business? Should you go to work there? Should you quit your job right now? Do you need to stay home? Do you need to come? God can lead you in the way that you should go, right? Now he says this, but be not like a horse or a mule without understanding which must be curbed with bit and bridle or it will st not stay near you. In other words, in order for God to get you to where you need to go, you need to be something that is very hard for Americans. It's called being teachable. That means you don't know everything. And God, if God is going to get you to where you need to go, there's going to be some moments where you are stepping in a direction that in order to experience the best needs to be adjusted. And when confronted, we need to process that as a form of reboot. You're going the wrong way. I had a conversation, was getting involved with an investment. I was talking, I'll just be upfront with you, with my wife. And I was getting ready to do a project. And Rowena said, I don't think that we should do that. I was like, oh, no, no, this will be really good. We should do that. It will help this person, and we'll be able to make a little bit of money on the side. It'll be really good. It's going to all work good. Okay, I really don't think we should do that. This person's uh, having some challenges and struggling, and so I, they're also close friends, and I don't think we should do that. And guess what? I did not heed counsel when confronted. And I will tell you that uh, confrontation is a great thing to help you to get to the spot where you want to go. Are you teachable? God has placed parents in your life. He's placed friends in your life. God has actually placed spiritual leaders. See, a lot of people look at their spiritual leaders, pastors or, or other church leaders as uh, advisors. Oh, I'll get some advice here and there. God has actually like placed spiritual leaders in some cases in your life because God, wouldn't it be great if he just spoke out of heaven and said, hey, stop doing that because you would listen to him, right? Oh, I'd always listen to God if God spoke. You know that 90% of the time that God's ever spoken to me, he's done it through other people. And it's, some of it's affirmation, you're going the right way, but some of it is, don't go that way, that's dangerous. Who are you to tell me that the way I talked to my wife crushed her? She needed to hear that she needs to line the chairs up. And so by being open, allowing God to use people in our lives, being teachable allows us to arrive where we need to be. Of course, our teachers are the Holy Spirit ultimately through people, but God has given us his word and spiritual leaders because there's got to be moments of confrontation. Are you willing to have a confrontation? Listening to a podcast, hearing that you're wrong or whatever it would be. Yes. Having somebody who loves you, a close friend to say, hey, listen, seriously, the way you just spoke to your wife, that's wrong. You crushed her. Or, hey, I noticed that you, you don't discipline your child. That's not gonna turn out well later on. I wanna encourage you. It's important to say no. And that when you hear that, you allow God to speak through those moments as a form of divine reboot so that you can get everything back into sync. Because if you're out of sync with your wife, here's again, I think I probably have already said this, but when you're out of sync with your wife, guess what the Bible says that your prayers will be hindered. Because you can't be out of sync with your wife and be in sync with God. You can't hate your enemy and love God, the Bible says. They have to be synchronized. There's also a conflict. You have to be able to hit reset, allow your heart to be aligned with God, get aligned with people so that it will flow moving forwards. So stand with me. We're going to receive communion. And I want to say if you're here in the room or you're at home and you've yet to start a relationship with God, today's a great day to start that process because ultimately you are born with fragmented software. I don't know if you ever bought a brand new phone. I had a couple people in our first service this morning who had bought brand new phones and turned them on and the things wouldn't even boot, it, boot up. I don't know if you know this, but you, when you were born as a child, beautiful, cute as you were, not like some of the other babies, you were beautiful, okay? You, everything was proportional on you and you had the right amount of hair, you were the right color, you weren't blue or you didn't have a cone head, you were, you were perfect. But even inside of all of that, guess what? Your software was flawed. The Bible says we're born in sin. 
And until you experience the work of Christ in your heart and life, until you submit to that, you will always be functioning with glitching hardware. You'll always be working around it. You'll always be trying to make this thing work to the best of your ability, but it will never work the way that God intended. But I promise you this, your first reboot by saying, Lord, come into my life. I give you my life, take control. There's an instant upload of brand new hardware, firmware, um, uh, not hardware, let me get my terms correct. So we've got technology people in the room. Update of some firmware. And all of a sudden, the fragments are gone and now things will begin to sink. But you will, after that, need to still reboot occasionally. But I wanna invite you this morning, if you need to say yes to Jesus for the first time, again, here in the room or at home, just gonna pray for you and want you to just invite him in the way that I help you to. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for each person that's listening. And Lord, we're born into so many difficult situations and seasons and family difficulties and social and maybe regional difficulties. Imagine a child being born in this season or in a, in a third world country where there's genocides going on, the, the separated from parents, the things that can happen, Lord. All of us need that first divine reboot. It's called saying yes to you. So we do that right now. Maybe our life has been good, but the software is still not correct. So we give you our life. Lord, we ask you to pour your spirit into us. You've promised that you would give us a new heart. You'd give us a new spirit that you put your spirit within us, that you carry to us to healthy places when we do that. Father, we thank you for that. We say yes to Jesus. We say yes to this reboot. Take control of our lives. Bring us into sync. Teach us to move forward in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now for the rest of you who are uh, already serving God, we're going to receive our communion. If you'll take out the bread. This represents all that Christ did in his body being horrifically brutalized, but for good purpose. It's your life needed a reboot, right? And so as you take the bread and hold it in your hands, I want you to look at that and just look at that as being the payment that it is for your synchronized best life. Jesus died for your sins, but he also died for your life. Does not want to just pay for your sins, but you also have the juice, which represents life. And so today, as we receive communion, this is a reboot in small ways, right? Should be some juice and crackers there around you. Let's pray over these elements. Father, we thank you for this moment, the opportunity to reboot, to be reminded of the powerful price that you paid in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that you will realign me in this moment as a believer. Father, if I picked up debris in this COVID season, bad attitudes, maybe some wrong behaviors, maybe even drifted spiritually. Maybe I've been away from you, God. Maybe, maybe I've been so far away from you, God, that the reason why I'm not in the house of God has nothing to do with COVID or social distancing. It's I'm actually hiding from you because I'm ashamed. Father, I pray in this moment, there'll be that divine reset, that reboot, to know that shame is not our, our sentence, but God, right standing with you is so possible. Father, bless these, these communion elements. And we receive them in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Go ahead and participate in that. And as you're drinking, as you're eating the bread and as you're drinking the juice, let me just, again, let's just give God thanks. Father, we pray that these elements will be a reboot in our lives. Father, let it wash over our souls. Let it tear open the stony hearts. May your juice, which is symbolic of your blood, bring me back to a spot of looking you in the eye and saying yes to your love, your passion for me walking with you. Allow it to impact my family, my children right now, kids who might be far from you. Father, let us hit reset as a church to hit reset in a season that's crazy, but a national reset. God, we pray over the future for our nation. Father, we believe that you've got raising up godly leaders. Some of them might be in this room or listening right now. Father, we don't want to run away from the world. We want to run into the world. We want to run into dangerous places with confidence like Daniel. Um, and his three contemporaries, God, to impact a nation that what the enemy meant for evil became good. God, for us, let us run into those places. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Touch, touch our people, touch our world. Amen and amen. Let's sing this one final song together, and then Pastor Saxon will be up to dismiss.
There's a case when the heart is under fire When the walls are closing in When I look at the space between Where I used to be And this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me There was another in the water Holding back the seas Should I ever need a reminding Of how I've been set free There is a cross that bears the burden Where another died for me There is another in the fire sin anymore Should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning In the day I will bow to the things of this world I know I will never be The power lives in me There is another in the fire darkness bows to him I can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between west and I can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in nothing stands between us nothing stands between us between all the things unseen and this reckoning I know I will never be alone I know I will never be alone there'll be another in the fire standing next to me there'll be another And should I ever need reminding How good you've been to me I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be And I can see the light in the darkness As the darkness bows to him I can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between where's thin I can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in nothing stands between us nothing stands between us there'll be another in the fire 
standing next to me There'll be another in the waters Holding back the seas and Should I ever need reminding How good you've been to me I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be Count the joy, come every battle. Cause I know that's where you'll be. I count the joy, come every battle. Cause I know that's where you'll be. Count the joy, come Thank you, Jesus. Cause I know that's where you'll be. Thank you, Father. God, we thank you that no matter what we face in this life, God, we could call on your name and you respond every time. God, we thank you that at our very worst, God, we called on your name and you responded. God, you said in your word, while we were yet sinners, you sent your son to die for us. God, we thank you for that. God, we thank you that, that you are so faithful, that you, that you meet us at our point of need. God, we thank you, God, that you are right here with us. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want you to know we so appreciate you being here this morning. We so appreciate you joining with us on, on Facebook or wherever you're joining with us at. And we want you to know uh, also uh, if you need prayer, uh, you can text uh, our, our prayer number. Um, it's 360-727. I'm going to get this wrong. 727-0603. Uh, text the word prayer, and uh, we'll be sure to join with you uh, in any prayer needs that you have. But we want to just say thank you again for being here. We love you guys. Uh, you are dismissed. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. God bless you. You're dismissed. Woo! Woo! Yeah, let's say.
Southwest Washington.